Today, we're going to be looking at the case of Lars Mittank, a disappearance widely considered one of the most troubling mysteries ever caught on camera. On June 30th, 2014, 28-year-old Lars Mittank, an engineer from Germany, went on holiday to Varna, Bulgaria with some of his friends. They spent the week partying, going on pub crawls, playing football and sunbathing. As their holiday came to a close, they went to the pub to watch the World Cup quarterfinal match between Costa Rica and the Netherlands. There, Lars got into a disagreement with a group of other German tourists over football rivalry, with Lars being a fan of Werder Bremen and the German tourists being fans of Bayern Munich. At the time, nothing came of the disagreement and everybody left the bar peacefully. As the night came to a close, Lars's friends went into McDonald's for a late night meal, but Lars wasn't interested and decided to wait outside for them. However, when his friends left the restaurant, Lars was nowhere to be seen. It wasn't until the morning after that Lars reappeared, showing up at the Golden Sands resort that they were staying in, claiming to have been beaten up by four men that had been hired by the other German tourists. As a result of the confrontation, he had suffered an injured jaw and a ruptured eardrum. He went to see a doctor for his injuries and as a result of his ruptured eardrum, he was advised that he shouldn't fly. He was also prescribed with an antibiotic known as Cefprozil 500 and was actually advised to go to the hospital but refused. When his friends found out that he wouldn't be able to fly with them, they wanted to stay behind with him, but he insisted that he was fine and that they should travel as planned. According to them, when they left him, he was in a good mood and seemed relaxed about the whole thing. Lars checked out of the Golden Sands Resort and checked into a hostel near the airport called Hotel Kolovana whilst he waited for his ear to heal. From the moment he checked in, however, he started behaving very erratically. He was seen on the hostel's CCTV cameras pacing up and down the foyer, seemingly paranoid and frightened. He also seemed to be checking out the windows and even hid in the elevator for a prolonged period of time. It was clear that he was apprehensive about something or someone, but what it was was never seen on camera. As night fell a few hours later, he called his mother and said that there was something strange about the hostel he was staying in, and even asked her to cancel all of his credit cards. A few hours later at 1am, he called her again, this time whispering. He told her that he was in a high place and was afraid to move in case he fell. When she asked what he was doing, he told his mother that he was hiding from four strange men and that he was worried that they were coming to kill him. On the airport security cameras, Lars can be seen entering the airport with his luggage before going to consult the airport doctor, Dr. Kostov. Dr. Kostov actually advised against Lars flying, but he was so insistent that he be allowed to go that he signed a declaration taking full responsibility for any of the consequences of him flying. On top of the injuries, however, Dr. Kostov was also concerned about Lars's behavior. According to him, Lars was acting very nervous and erratic and was asking a lot of questions about the medication he was taking. Whilst all of this was going on, the airport was actually undergoing maintenance at the time and during a line of questioning, a construction worker entered the room. As a result, Lars became anxious and began muttering to himself, the doctor tried to calm him down, but he stood up and bolted out of the room, and as Lars sprinted out of the airport, he was heard yelling, I don't want to die here, I need to get out of here. Leaving his luggage, phone and wallet behind, Lars ran off the airport grounds, climbed a 2.5 meter barbed wire fence, ran into the woods, and was never seen again. To this day, Lars has not been found and his whereabouts is completely unknown. Lars's family set up a reward for any information that could help find him, and even hired a private investigator to find out what had happened. But unfortunately, both attempts came up empty. The German community in Varna even volunteered to help find him, but unfortunately, they found nothing. To this day, Lars's disappearance remains one of the most infamous unsolved mysteries on the internet. Amongst all of the investigations and all of the speculation online, there are four major theories on what happened. The first theory is that Lars was right. There really were four people out to get him. This would certainly explain the lack of a dead body because if they had killed him, they likely would have disposed of his body in a way that it would never be found again. There's also no way of disproving that anything he claimed he saw or anything he was paranoid about was actually untrue. However, many people consider this theory to be extremely unlikely. First of all, it would be quite excessive for those four German tourists to hire someone to kill him over a disagreement about football. Plus, if they had wanted to kill him as a result of their disagreement, why would they not have just killed him on that night? 
Additionally, if four people were after him and he was thinking straight, why would he not just go to speak to the police? In fact, Lars's friends don't actually believe that he was beaten up that night. To them, the lack of clear wounds and the erratic story that he put together just didn't make sense to them. With no real evidence that anyone was following him and no clear motive, most people consider that this theory just doesn't have enough weight to it. That then brings us on to the second theory, which is to do with drug trafficking. Some people think that Lars and his friends were actually smuggling drugs on their flight, and because of the potential flight risk, proponents of the theory suggest that Lars was kept behind as insurance until drugs were successfully smuggled on the other side. This perhaps explains why he ran and jumped over a barbed wire fence and disappeared into the woods, because perhaps they were watching him. If the smuggling was indeed unsuccessful on the other side, maybe they really were out to get him to cash in on their insurance. This might also explain why Lars never reached out to police, because if drug trafficking was involved, perhaps he didn't want to get into trouble abroad. This theory, however, is often also dismissed. According to his friends, as far as they're aware at least, at no point during his life did Lars ever take drugs, sell drugs, traffic drugs, and apparently none of them did any of that whilst on the holiday. It therefore seems weird to them that he would traffic drugs, having never been involved in that kind of lifestyle. Furthermore, the luggage and all of his belongings that he left behind were searched and analysed, and no traces of drugs were ever found on any of them. Many people also often question why the friends never admitted to it if this theory was true. And the biggest hurdle to this theory is that Bulgaria and Germany are both EU countries. All borders between the two are land borders that anyone can cross freely. They may have had to show passports on a train or on a coach, but airport security is much tighter. If they were smuggling drugs, why would they risk getting caught by airport security? This theory again would explain why a body was never found, because if the Mafia got hold of him, they obviously would have disposed of his body in a way that it would never be found again. But with no information ever coming out from any of his friends about this, and of course the practical issues, many consider this theory to be extremely unlikely as well. This, therefore, leads us onto the third theory, that he escaped to start a brand new life. Proponents of this theory think that his friends were right, the fight never happened. They also go on to suggest, however, that Lars came up with this lie on purpose to give him a reason to stay behind by himself. In fact, when sniffer dogs were brought onto the scene, they tracked his path through the woods and onto the highway. Perhaps Lars manufactured this entire story, disappeared from CCTV, and hitchhiked away to start a brand new life. Once again, however, a lot of people are unconvinced by this theory. First of all, he left without his luggage, wallet and phone, meaning that he didn't have any of his items and didn't have any money to get anywhere with. On top of that, he didn't have any personal problems to be escaping from. He was in a long-term relationship with his girlfriend, who he was apparently happy with. He was getting along well with his friends whilst on holiday with them, and he was getting along well with his family back home. With no money or any of his belongings to start a new life with, and no clear motive to want to leave his past life behind, once again, many consider this theory to be extremely unlikely. This then leaves us with the fourth and final theory, that it was all in his head. The most common suggestion is that he was suffering from latent paranoid schizophrenia, which could have been naturally occurring, or could have been set off by one of various possible triggers. For example, it could have been triggered by the brain damage he suffered as a result of the fight. He did get a blow to the jaw and a blow to the eardrum, meaning that he was hit to the head at least twice. On top of that, there's a very real possibility that it was drug-induced. There have been several scientific articles published in the last 10 years alone that link antibiotics with severe disruptions in brain function. There's also been a recent case study of a woman who developed acute psychosis just one day after taking Cefprozil. In that study, she began suffering from delirium, which can cause mental confusion that may be accompanied by hallucinations and agitation. Although admittedly incredibly rare, this is an incredibly rare case. And whatever the trigger might have been, the sudden onset of severe psychotic symptoms is not uncommon. This could explain why his condition deteriorated so rapidly after his friends left, and some people even suggest that him starting the fight in the bar in the first place was the first sign of psychotic symptoms, such as poor judgment, manifesting themselves. Perhaps even the story of him getting into a fight was the first of his psychosis-induced delusions. Paranoia being another symptom would explain his paranoia around the medicine, which is why he sent that text to his mother, 
and why he asked that doctor so many questions. Additionally, the fact that he didn't go to police despite believing that there were four men out to kill him suggests that he had undergone serious psychological changes. This to many people seems to be the most likely theory because it seems to make the most sense of his erratic and paranoid behavior. The only question it begs though is what happened to him? If he just lost his mind, how could he just disappear? Is he perhaps still out there living as a homeless man not knowing who he is? Does he perhaps still know who he is but he's still living in fear that these four men are still out to get him? His mother, Sandra, believes that he still is out there. She has appeared on countless TV and radio shows across Germany and Bulgaria, promoting the Lars Mittank missing persons case. So far, her efforts have come up empty, but undaunted, she continues to post messages to social media to this day. Additionally, a Facebook group, tens of thousands of people strong, called Find Lars Mittank, regularly posts to the social media site, and even organise the distribution of flyers across the entire continent of Europe, all in an effort to find the world's most famous missing tourist. There's a good chance he'll come back, his mother says. He just needs my help. Thank you for watching, and hopefully I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.